The smart meters are meters that the Department of Water and Power will be installing on all the homes and businesses in the city of Los Angeles. And I don't want to get too deep into it, so what I'll do is introduce the parties. Right. This forum will be a 50-minute forum, 5-0. We're going to have 20 minutes per side, and we will have an additional 10 minutes for questions. Be one question per person. Board will go first. So will these speakers please, uh, please come up? All right, uh, my name is Marcelo DePaulo. I am a, an engineer at LADWP. I am the program manager for DWP's Smart Grid project. And Good evening, my name is Cindy Sage. I'm the owner of Sage Associates, which is an environmental sciences consulting firm in Santa Barbara. Um, I have uh, been an environmental consultant for sure. 40 years this year. Um, I'm also um, one of the founding faculty members of the University of California at Santa Barbara Environmental Studies Program uh, 40, more than 40 years ago now. And uh, our firm specializes in looking at um, the, the health and property impacts of electromagnetic fields from things like transmission lines and from radio frequency radiation from wireless. Um, that's what I'll be speaking about tonight. Thank you. I'm Victoria Cross and I'm with LADWP. Also, I'm your council liaison. Um, whenever you have any questions, you can uh, go through me if that makes it easier for you. But I've lectured at SC and different universities, and I can't talk sitting down. I'm Italian. You're going to see my hands moving a lot. And, but what I wanted to do is kind of come out here and basically give a bunch of information about what LADWP is doing, and more importantly, um, get the facts out there that way with the program I'm trying to launch right now, that way it can be really successful. And quite frankly, I'm a, I'm a rate payer. I live in Woodland Hills. Um, it's kind of cool. I finally get to go to my neighborhood council. So I, what I wanted to do is come out here and educate and get the information out what's going on. One thing I'd like to correct, we are not doing a citywide smart meter program. We are doing a smart grid demonstration program that basically back in 2009, um, the Department of Energy um, released a bunch of American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funding. Uh, they gave us the opportunity to apply for it. I wrote a grant application. We ended up winning a $60 million grant. So as a result of the $60 million grant, we are basically going to be doing uh, research in smart grid technologies to see what it would take to actually implement this technology, what the true cost will be for the ratepayer, and then more importantly, find out what actually works. You know, there's certain times where in, in life where it makes sense, you want to be the first on the block to buy a plasma TV just because you want to be the first to get it. But with certain technologies that are in the computer industry and technology, it kind of pays off being a little bit slower, learning from your neighbors, and then when you see what actually works, then adopting and going in something that's more secure, more reliable, and quite frankly, it reduces the chances of you spending money on a technology that you're going to have to replace in a few years. So what's being passed around, and I'm not sure if I, oh cool. So basically what I have here is a, is a presentation that pretty much is a talking guide of what our program is and what we're doing. Um, I'm going to kind of go ad lib from it, but basically right here is all every little detail of it. But what we are doing right now is this demonstration grant where it's basically a five-year program. It's $120 million that we are going to be um, basically uh, doing four main demonst uh, demonstration projects. The four main demonstration projects fall in the fields of demand response studies, um, electric vehicles, um, cybersecurity, and consumer behavior and consumer interactions. So within here, as part of this, we targeted these three microgrids, these three areas around USC, UCLA, and the Valley to actually test the technology just because we had existing automation and existing infrastructure in those areas to see what technology would best work. And part of the reason also why we're using the USC and UCLA areas as well is when we actually wrote the grant, we actually partnered with USC, UCLA, and JPL in actually doing it. So our program goals, 
basically, when you look at the customer benefits or the customer behavioral studies is, we're gonna be installing smart meters across um, various, these three microgrids or three micro areas, and we're gonna install a total of 52,000 meters. This program is a demonstration project and people within this neighborhood and other neighborhoods have received letters over the last couple months where it says, congratulations, you've been selected, so forth. And basically on the bottom it even says, if you don't wish to participate or you want more information, call this number. It's purely a volunteer optional program that we're allowing our community to pick and actually choose where or not to participate. Part of the reason that we want people to sign up and participate is we actually want to capture the consumer behavioral studies associated with these programs. You know, part of the goal is to capture the benefits that we can actually get with AMI and with these demand response energy efficiency programs. Quite frankly, if we don't get our customers to actually participate and be engaged into it, we really don't know what the true benefit is. You know, we can, we can hire a consulting company that get, writes a great paper, explains all the benefits in the world, but what we truly want to see is, based on your interactions, based on your reactions, what you're going to do and see if the numbers that we're projecting for the savings by doing it are actually real. Also what we want to do in, within these programs, like for instance, is introduce some citywide benefits like by having more telemetry in our substations and having more automation within our field, uh, within the field, we'll be able to do additional grid monitoring, we'll be able to improve our reliability within the power system, and the one feature that that I'm really proud of is basically we'll be able to actually go to someone's house before you make a phone call that saying that your lights are out. I don't know um, if you guys experienced this, but I've had a power outage in my old house I used to have, and the most frustrating thing is you go into my house, I, don't, I no longer have a phone that has a cord. All of them are wireless ones, so when the power went out, the phone didn't work. So this is an opportunity now with the meters that we're testing how the, how the meter works, how it tells you when an outage comes, and how quickly we can actually go out there and restore the power to the home. What we're also gonna be able to do, and these are gonna be some customer benefits, is we're gonna be able to do more accurate meter reading. I, I know how many people here have solar meters and have had issues with your solar bills being kind of messed up. Part of it has to do that right now we're actually introducing a brand new billing system. We're actually gonna try and test these meters and see if they work better with the billing system so that we can get to a point of eventually billing people more accurately and more frequently instead of having a bill every two months or having the horrible bill of August where you get the sticker shock of over a couple thousand dollars on an electric bill. Well, what also we're going to be doing is throughout this project is providing real-time access for our customers. So if you have a smart meter, you choose to participate. When you log into your DWP website and you log into your account to pay your bill, there'll actually be a special portal that we've created where we are going to have information where you're going to be able to see what your consumption is, you're going to be able to see what your usage is, and quite frankly, it's going to also provide you information on energy efficiency and different things you could do within your home to reduce your bill. Lastly, and one of the other hidden treasures of this program is uh, for people who have EVs. One of the things that this program has been able to fund is we created an EV rebate program where customers who have an EV, if they're willing to buy an EV and want a charger in their home, we're gonna be providing up to a $2,000 rebate to pay for the charger infrastructure, the construction, the, the, the wiring, as well as the charger itself. So what this program is doing right now is it's trying to actually get more information back to the utility and at the same time bring some benefits of this smart technology out to our customers and at the same time both of us learn what the best thing is for y'all and for us as well. And then lastly, the last thing that you'll see is within this, um, I think it's page seven on the presentation, it gives a rough estimate of what the timeline is of what we're gonna be doing. So basically right now, we're in the middle of testing and commissioning the computer systems back at LADWP so that we can talk to all the various equipments that we're installing. And we're gonna be actually beginning meter deployment right now within the next two or three weeks. We're gonna start putting meters and I think we're, we're starting towards in the West LA work area and working our way north. So we're gonna be slowly month by month installing meters and getting up to the 52,000 by the end of this summer. And then lastly, what will be the main result of this is within the next two years, JPL, USC, UCLA, and ourselves are going to be conducting experiments, writing research papers, and explaining what are the benefits and what are the 
the standards that we want to make uh, constantly across the utilities and across the U.S. so that basically smart grid programs can actually be successful. Um, I, I would like to say that um, I'm here tonight at uh, the kind invitation of, of the Advisory Council um, and the recommendation of um, some of your um, interested citizens to talk about some of the um, issues and problems with smart meters that have come about in the last two years or two and a half years. Um, over the last couple of years, um, my company has been involved in doing technical work related to the operation of these meters, of wireless electric meters, as they're installed and operated, not as they're tested in isolation by the Federal Communications Commission, uh, one at a time in isolation and uh, not in an idealized fashion in uh, testing laboratories, but as they actually operate and as they actually affect people, as it turns out. We do technical studies that include computer modeling of the radio frequency wireless uh, emissions that come from them. We've created a report um, at sagereports.com, which is a large technical computer modeling report with a summary that's readable. And we're going to be handing out tonight uh, a, a set of um, links to websites where you can download the information that I'm talking about that is the background for my, the, the professional opinions that, that I'm here to speak with you tonight about. The second report I'd like to bring to your attention, and this is really a challenge because I'm having to spin around here to actually see everyone, so I'm going to stand here for a minute and hope I can see all of your faces. The, the second report I'd like to bring to your attention is the 2012 Bioinitiative Report. This is a, a report prepared by 29 experts uh, from around the world on the issue of radio frequency wireless health effects. This is a study that updates a 2007 study we completed, and there are 1,800 studies since 2007 when we published the first bioinitiative that detail why people are concerned about radio frequency wireless exposures. And these come from uh, things like cell towers, cell and cordless phones, wireless routers, um, all of the PDA devices that people use, and also from wireless electric meters, wireless gas meters, and wireless water meters. So the reason I'm here tonight is to, is to share with you not only places to look for information, but also to share with you the experience that, that, that has, has rolled out already with Southern California Edison, who is way ahead in deployment of the same types of meters as we understand it, and also PG&E. Now, one of the things I realize in coming here is that I don't, and you don't, and the Advisory Council, and, and, and you, the people who will be getting the meters, don't yet really know the specifications of these meters. Are they like PG&E's? Are they like Edison's? From the research that we've done with the FCC identification numbers and the RF engineering reports that have been prepared, they look very similar. So I believe that the experience of people who have had these meters installed in PG&E territory and Southern California Edison territory should have some meaning to you tonight. And I would very much like to submit a list of technical questions to LADWP tonight for them to provide answer, specific answers back to your advisory committee and to the public. Because the public really doesn't know what kind of impacts they may have in terms of, of health, in terms of property value impacts, or the, the use of property. Depending on where that meter is located today, and this would be your old spinning dial electromechanical meter, what will happen is that that meter will be replaced by a new meter. And that new meter has, it operates wirelessly. And those wireless impacts are biologically very similar to the impacts that you would have from a cell tower. 
The reason we did the computer modeling was to test this. You can see the result of our work. And what we find in some cases is that if your meter currently is located very near to occupied space within your home, then you can have levels of radio frequency wireless exposure that are reported to have biological effects and adverse health effects with chronic exposure. Not short-term exposure, but in a living space, in occupied space. And we think that this debate about smart meters, which is not just here, not just in California, but has become literally a national, well, a North American issue of public concern because the Canadians are extremely active over whether or not this form of energy conservation, which we agree is a good goal, is best served by putting wireless meters rather than hardwired meters or some other form of safer meter on every single home and every single business that uses electricity. So the issue first and foremost is, is this a smart business model to provide a device for energy conservation, which again we all agree is a worthy goal, if there are going to be unintended consequences in terms of health impacts for people. Now the experience of Southern California Edison meters and a PG&E meters has been that there is a, a, a rather substantial population of people that are adversely affected. And again, it depends on where they're located in relation to your occupied space, but it's worse where you have high density housing, where you have townhouses, condominiums, and apartments, because someone's unit will have many, many electric meters on one wall, and everyone is living within close space. So the effects of radio frequency wireless uh, on health are magnified. That is, um, unfortunately, something I think that was probably not intended when these devices were rolled out, but since the programs have started, we now have classification of radio frequency wireless exposure uh, at, to be a carcinogen. It is a cancer-causing agent in group 2B. This was, this was, you know, DWP has come into this a little bit later than some of the other utilities, which is good because you can learn from these experiences, but I'll bet when you first got your grants, the World Health Organization had not studied the health effects of wireless and classified it to be a possible human carcinogen, which it is classified as today in the same category as DDT and lead and engine exhaust. So we think that all utilities should really be reconsidering whether or not wireless is the right way to go about achieving the goals that you're looking to achieve. And certainly you can be learning from the experience of other utilities that have run up against a buzzsaw of public controversy and public pushback on these. Uh, Southern California Edison submit submissions to the California Public Utilities Commission indicate that between 40 and 50 percent of their customers would opt out given the knowledge they have today. And these numbers preceded the classification of, of wireless to be a, a possible human carcinogen. So probably if you took that poll today, there would be a greater number of people that would say, well, you know, I'll, I'll do some energy conservation, but I really don't want to take the risk for my family of having a wireless meter on the wall of my home. It's not voluntary unless there's an opt-out program, and of course, one of my questions to DWP is, will there be a broad opt-out policy, and will that go for whole communities or whole neighborhoods? Because these wireless meters, of course, from your neighbors will affect your property. So your opting out may not be enough for your comfort and safety and, and, and use of your property. The, the health and safety issues um, of, of this are not concluded, there isn't, con con obviously, there is not yet conclusive proof of harm. But I think the issue here is, if we have options uh, for these meters, uh, they could be wired, they, you know, there could be um, some sort of use of telephone lines or, other, or hopefully shielded cable to transmit these signals, perhaps it would be a smarter thing to do now that we know about this. 
And the, uh, the costs of making a wrong choice are enormous when you think about the millions and millions and millions of meters that we're talking about. If it doesn't work out, if it's a bad business model, if there are health effects, and that leads to, uh, we would expect lawsuits from people who feel they've been ha damaged or harmed, why not make a mid-course correction now? It, it, would make, it would make business sense to do that. The other issues that are also significant in, in relation to the use of wireless as your core for planning how you, how you sell electricity and how you bill for electricity and how you keep track of when the lights go out somewhere. You know, it, it, there are issues with wireless that put national security at greater risk. And if you doubt this, you might think back to uh, the recent remarks by Leon Panetta, the Department of Defense uh, chief, who shortly before he retired said that he thought that cyber attacks through internet and particularly through wireless uh, connections that hold our, our, our electric grid together, our banking, our commerce, and so on, are all much more vulnerable. And we do not have the safeguards that we need in place. So making electric grids more risky and not less risky is not a good idea from the point of view of a number of federal agencies, including DOD and the Department of Homeland Security. But beyond that, there is the risk of uh, loss of personal information. Uh, the, 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 the loss of use of property. If you have a room that uh, is, is exposed to high fields and you don't feel comfortable using that room, if that was a bedroom for a child, for example, uh, that, is, uh, that is a loss of value. There is also the issue of interference with medical devices because um, if you know anyone who has a diabetic child, for example, and they have a wireless insulin pump that they depend on, embedded. Radio frequency interference from these meters is untested and is worrisome. Uh, for people who have deep brain stimulators, for Parkinson's patients, for example, the electrodes can simply uh, be shut down. There are significant ADA, American with Disabilities, issues that are unresolved. Again, casting a bad shadow on the wireless aspect of these meters. The, the thing about the, the system that has not yet been described, and, and I'd hoped um, that our representative from LADWP would actually talk about the way these systems work, um, unless theirs is different um, than those that are already operational, I can give you a, a quick overview, and you can correct me if, uh, if, if they are very different. But generally, it's this. The meter goes on the wall wherever your electric meter is now. They come and they swap out the old one, put on a new one, and it is a radio frequency emitter. Radi it, it radiates many bursts per day. PG&E's estimate is up to 190,000 bursts of radio frequency a day as a maximum. No one really knows how much they will create. But it has to relay information from the meter to the utility, so there will be in many cases, a mesh network of antennas, cellular antennas, uh, that go up through neighborhoods. They're sometimes, they're sometimes called distributed antenna system uh, networks, which will mean many more antennas up and down every block, and they're small, but they're meant to repeat. And also, your smart meter or wireless meter, at least if they're ITRON meters, will piggyback the signals of others around you if they're not able to get uh, to the mesh network. But the third part of this that, that we really want to hear about is the, the, the way in which they collect information about electrical usage. Because power transmitters, which are small devices designed to go into the appliances and report their usage, will eventually, uh, well, actually they already are being built into appliances today. And if you go out and buy a new dishwasher or a new refrigerator or a, you know, a, a new washer and dryer. <clears throat> if you buy certain brands today, like Bosch, they already have these power transmitters inside. These are also radio frequency wireless emitters. 
And where they go is right, if you're looking at your dishwasher, they go on the, uh, they're, they're built to the, into the motherboard, into the control panel. And their radio frequency emitter is right at waist height for you. And if you have smaller children or you have animals, right at eye level for, for the little ones. Now, you could have, with a, a fully smart kitchen, you, you might have many of these meters, all producing radio frequency, talking to your wireless meter, which in turn is talking back to the utility. This is radio frequency wireless saturation that, that is intentional. So this is the issue. Is this the, best way, is this the best way for us to think about energy conservation and management when we know that this has been recently classified as an exposure at legal levels, FCC legal levels, to be a possible human carcinogen. Is this the, the smart thing to do? Um, I won't have time tonight, obviously, to, to, to go through a lot of the scientific literature, so I will lay out um, a list with websites that you can go to that provide you with good published information on this. And I would simply say, like other communities around the state, Right, that, that, you would, that, that you would simply look and become more educated on this topic and make sure that you're, you're, you're up on things before you're offered a meter or a chance for opt-out. And we certainly hope that that will come to be. So um, the facts you, made, you said are true about RF, but it's not true exactly with what we're doing. You know, um, it's on, it's on, just hold it. Okay, sorry. Uh, the points you made about RF technology and all that, okay, let me give you a little technical background about myself. I, I, I have three bachelor's degrees in engineering. I have a master's degree in electrical engineering. I'm a PhD candidate that's defending his dissertation in electrical engineering. Everything you said statistically, mathematically, is true. Yeah, RF technology at high radio frequencies, yeah, they're bad. But the meters that we have that we're going to be deploying are going to talk three times maximum a day. And then number two, there's, there's a lot of facts that are general facts of this stuff. So the, one of the things I kind of want to get out there. Oh, sorry. One of the things that I want to get out there is some of the facts that were said aren't, aren't exactly a like for like. Like, OK, just quick raise of hand. Who has a cell phone here? OK, so basically your meter has a cell phone. That's what's going inside your meter. So who has a Wi-Fi unit, in the, a wireless Wi-Fi in their home for their life? OK. You know, all these things can have certain levels of RF exposure. Now, there are FCC guidelines, there's, and there's also technical engineering standards made by NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards Technology Lab. There's IEEE, which is the governing body of all the engineering standards for electronics and power utilities. And basically, we also have studies that are done by companies like um, the Energy Research Every Energy Power Research Institute. All these people have published tons of articles about how transmission lines cause the exposure to certain RF on cell towers. Yeah, you're right. That's a lot of power. If you go near a microwave station, that's not good. You don't want to be near that. But what you're talking about is a cell phone that's outside your house that's maybe going to talk three times a day, every eight hours. We're going to call it. Give us your the KWH. We're going to store it. That's it. It is not potentially, yeah, if you ramp up, you put an antenna the size of probably, yeah, okay, an antenna the size of that big pointing at your head, yeah, you can have those kind of effects. But what we're talking about is a cell phone. A cell phone, yeah, there have been studies and links that over usage of cell phones and all that. We're talking maybe a 20 second cell phone conversation from the meter back to us. The level of exposure that we're looking at is not the levels that are being described right now. And to be blunt, OK, I would be a hypocrite living in Woodland Hills if I didn't sign up for one of these. I'm the manager of this program, and I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old at my house. I'm getting one of these smart meters. And quite frankly, if it wasn't safe, there'd be no way in hell I would have it in my house. We are doing these things, and we are doing research to make this utility more efficient. And quite frankly, I don't want my bill to go up anymore. I'm a ratepayer, and I work there. You know, having my bill go up every other month is not something I'm happy about. Our bills haven't gone up. They go up every, like, 
two years, every three years, but they're not going up like Edison and so forth. So when you look at the technologies of what's described in Edison's network where they have a, a Wi-Fi, RF cloud, where everything's jumping from area to area, cool, Edison did that. When you talk about what pg es did with their stuff, great, that's what pg e did. I'm not doing that. We're being a lot more conservative. We're putting in meters have cellular units. We are going to put some that do. We are in a, by the USC, UCL area. We are going to put some RF ones. We are going to test it. But the sheer volume and intensity and levels that are being described right now is not exactly what we want. Um, that, actually, that email that you actually talked about, the list of questions and all that, I did get it today. And I finally looked at it. If, they are, if you actually do have pointed questions, I'll answer them. There's nothing that we have to hide. And there's nothing that's out there. Yeah, go for it. And, um, and then the key thing is the links and stuff that were described, we also have papers. You know, one of the beautiful things about being a PhD student, and if you're good at math, statistics are amazing. You give me, you give me a bunch of numbers, I'll sell you a used car and make you feel happy at the end of the day. You know, mathematics and statistics, you can prove a lot of things with it. I'm not saying that RF, microwave, radio frequency is something that should be ignored. No, you're absolutely right. Cell towers, they do emit a lot of radiation. There are certain things. But when you actually do do these studies, you have to compare an apple with an apple. You don't compare an apple with a grapefruit. Are you employing a mesh network to get signals back? How are you collecting your data? It depends. You, you mentioned the vendor. The vendor we're buying is um, a company called iTron. We are buying their direct connect meters, have a built-in cell phone that communicate point to point. Vast majority of the installations will be using those. And the other uh, smaller percentage are actually going to be using um, their, what's that called, their open way RF one. That will be used. But the level and intensity in which those are on, they're not on all the time. All right, well, those are the same as Edison. And we can actually look up and, and, and verify these. And do they also include a, a, a Zigbee? Do they have two antennas with inside each meter that will be uh, no, operational at some point? No, the only ones that we're actually going to be using with the Zigbee are actually going to be in control labs and controlled environments to actually test if that even actually works. The problem with Zigbee is um, just like, I'm sorry, uh, the problem, we're, we're only going to be using the Zigbee meters in certain control labs where we can test. Because one of the problems, okay, anyone who has Wi-Fi in their home, they can experience this. You go, your Wi-Fi is in your office. As you walk to the other side of your house, or you go outside of your house, all of a sudden your Wi-Fi doesn't work. So Zigbee has a similar issue. So we want to actually learn and see how does it work? Does it actually communicate? And quite frankly, I'm looking at it like this. It's a hard sell. It's a hard sell to a rate payer. It's a hard sell. Well, I'm looking at it like this. I wouldn't be able to sell it to my wife. You know, I, we finally redid our kitchen for the first time. Kind of great, great project. She finally got her Viking range and her Viking refrigerator. I'm not replacing it. <laughs> I'm not going to buy a new one that has a module in it because, quite frankly, I paid a lot of money for it. So, you know, for these appliances and stuff like that that are controllable and all that stuff, that's going to be a, a rate payer, a customer's choice. If they want to have something, I don't see a rebate coming out there for these because they cost way too much money and the amount of load that can be shed is minimal. Turning off a refrigerator for 10 minutes, two minutes is not going to save the energy that a utility needs to if they have to shed power. Can, they, can a, a, an electric meter be remotely shut off? It's a, a firmware module that comes standard on all meters nowadays. Now, but the beautiful thing that we're doing is we're not actually using them. We're actually not enabling them. And even better, you know, and I, I forgot to mention this, you know, one of the cool things about our grant is one of our research partners is JPL. So we have JPL and Caltech helping us, and their sole focus, we're dedicating $15 million of their of research that's going to just go truly into cybersecurity. So what we're going to have is, um, I don't know, are there any Jeopardy fans here? There was a, I don't know if you guys saw that Jeopardy where this one guy won like 30 shows in a row, Jennings guy. Well, he eventually lost to a computer. The engineer that programmed to the computer actually works for me right now. So he's actually among a team of seven JPL scientists, a couple of them that worked on the Mars Rover project as well. They're actually building security layers that we're adding to our networks. We're adding them to our meters. Quite frankly, can something be hacked? Yeah, but with the levels of layers and the additional cybersecurity that we're adding to our meters, we're actually making it so our network is more secure, so that some of the issues that were talked about earlier are more planned for and protected for.
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Afshin Tajian. I'm one of the engineers working on uh, this project for Marcelo. Um, just to correct a couple of comments that you made, this project, the technology we use is similar to Southern California Edison, but not PGE. PGE is not using <clears throat> Itron OpenWay system. There, they have two other uh, manufacturers, Landis and Gear uh, and GE, that they, they are they are making those. So it's a little different. Um, as for the specifications not being announced is not true. The specifications for this project uh, and, and the meters, they are public information. The, the design of these meters are public information. There's a lot of things being said about these meters. If, if anyone with any basic engineering education look at the design of those meters, would find out that those claim like being like the surveillance, like, like uh, monitoring customers, like uh, all those claims. If, if anyone with basic engineering study, just uh, education, just look at those designs, would find out uh, those to be uh, incorrect. As for interference, uh, ITRON has done, has done a study for us. The, the, the RF channel that they've used is, is specifically protected. The 902 to 908 megahertz that they've picked uh, for, for this project um, is going to be controlled. As, as for cybersecurity, again, Marcelo mentioned uh, the JPL studies. We are using uh, advanced encryption system, AES, which has 128-bit key encryption system only for this project. However, if that system is even broken and they get their hands on the data, the data would be kilowatt hour usage data. It's not a kind of data that they can do anything with it, but all the data, all the communication, all the uh, anything that gets from meter to us, from us to meter, goes through 128-bit key encryption, which is uh, the possibility of breaking that would be uh, close to zero. Uh, we really like anyone here to study the EPRI uh, Electric Power Research Institute, uh, which, is, uh, which has the highest credential on these studies. Um, uh, to, to look at this study on the EPRI website, epri.com, that compares uh, uh, the, the power, the signal power of these meters to the cell phone. When you, when you see the power output of these meters is 0 0.000009 milliwatt, and you compare that to cell phone, which is one to five milliwatt, then, then you find out you know, a lot about all these claims. So please look at this study on, on epri.com. And um, uh, yeah, basically, that's it. Well, you said that the, the meter you're using is an itron. So does Southern California Edison. And I'll just say one thing about radio frequency interference. Um, the, the, the Southern California Edison group uh, troubleshooters, the people who work for Edison, um, told us that they can tell when, by zip code, the meters, the new wireless meters are installed in Fullerton or Anaheim, not Anaheim, but areas that they serve. The reason they can tell is that they, there are so many calls about radio frequency interference and interference with electronic devices that you already have and use and pay for uh, and interference with appliances that they get the calls and they can tell you where Corex, their subcontractor, is installing the meters. So it is not true that there is not a radio frequency interference issue. It is, it, that is what I'm saying about learning here from the investor-owned utilities who have made so many mistakes, well, and they're only finding out once they're deployed. The, the only reason that, and then again, Afshin explained it, and um, it's all about frequencies. You know, these meters have to talk in a certain 900 spectrum frequency. It's basically a dedicated frequency for these meters alone. The way that these are being designed, nothing else is allowed to operate at that, at that range of frequency. These are dedicated spectrums dedicated for these meters. You are right. There can be interference if you do it wrong. The Zigbee, the way you set up a Zigbee, the way you set up the stuff in the house can conflict with other stuff, but we are not doing what they're doing. You know, Again, and this is the only thing I caution is please, before these claims are said about what these meters are going to do, what we're going to do to people, first, I'll give you the spec. I'll, heck, 
I can't give you a meter because it's a gift of public funds, but I can show you one of the meters we have. I can give you the spec. You can even research it. But put it in a lab, take a look at it, and see what's going on. Because what you're describing, again, we're comparing an apple to a grapefruit. 